in the morning. On to the red planet. Planet, planet. Space Station Alpha should have all of the electricity it needs. The Endeavour astronauts installed the first of a series of huge solar panels, but there were some problems. Houston, we have a problem. A lot of it was developed right here in Cleveland. NASA's most embarrassing moment. Causing engineers to stop everything while they figured out why. Who's given us more than NASA? What in the world were they talking about? Weekday mornings 5 to 9 on News Radio WTAM 1100. Hey, I have to cover the results of the election. You're the media director, right? That's my job. So, uh, what are the results of the election? Well, who's in the White House, what is the vice president, and I don't know who's on the cabinet, probably. That's what I want to find out. I said, who is in the White House, what is the vice president, and I don't know who's on the cabinet, probably. Do you know the fellow's names? Fine, media director, I would be if I didn't know their names. Well, then, who's in the White House? Yes. I mean his name. Who? The guy in the Oval Office. Who? The chief executive. Who? The leader of the free world. Who is in the White House? Now, what are you asking me for? I'm telling you. Who? Who is in the White House? Well, I'm asking you. Who is in the White House? That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The president. Who is in the White House? Wait a second. At the convention, who was nominated? Sure was. Who was? Yes. Remember, his wife made a big speech. Whose wife? Yes. Okay, answer this. Whose wife becomes the first lady? And a fine first lady she'll be. Whose wife? That's right. Look. Didn't we just have an election? Absolutely. Who won the election? In a close one. In a close one. Yes. But he won, right? Who won? I don't know the winner. He wasn't even running. How did he win? He didn't win. He's going to be named to the cabinet. Who? No, he's the president. Who is? Right. All I want to know is what's the president's name? What's the vice president's name? I don't know. He's on the cabinet. How did we get to the cabinet member? You mentioned one of their names. Wait a second. I voted. Good for you. The guy I voted for won. He did. Do you know which candidate got my vote? Who? I just told you, the winner. Who? The new president. That's right. What's his name? What is the vice president's name? I'm not asking you the vice president's name. What? I want to talk about the president. Who? The president. That's right. Just tell me this. What is the president's name? What is the vice president's name? I don't know. The, the cabinet. cabinet. Never mind. I'm turning on CNN. Even your kids will love Paul Harvey. I love you, you love me, we're as happy. Three times a day. As WTAM. Well, 1100. All a big trick. Mike's not really here. We're playing a tape. Don't call the station. No one will answer right now. This is the best of Mike Trevisano on the big one. WTAM 1100. Three balls, one strike. Hit high and deep. You can forget about this one. It is way back. Over the end. <laughs> Where the heck did Percy go? Percy go, Percy go. Where the heck did Percy go? Percy go. I don't know. <laughs> Where the heck did Percy go? Percy go, Percy go. Where the heck did Percy go? Percy go. I don't know. What we really want to see, the same Percy at Free Save D. Signed this year in free agency, have you seen that Percy? All the Browns fans wear dog ears and want to cheer. And drink some beer! He had nine picks just last year, he had no fear, so he came here. Where the heck did Percy go, Percy go, Percy go? Where the heck did Percy go, Percy go? I don't know! Percy, Percy, you never seem to make a play. Percy, Percy, what have you got to say? Percy, Percy, we all know you have fallen. Percy, Percy, your pitcher's on a milk carton. Where the heck did Percy go? Percy, go, Percy, go. Where the heck did Percy go? Percy, go. I don't know! Percy, Percy, you never seem to make a play. Percy, Percy, what have you got to say? Percy, Percy, we all know you have fallen. Percy, Percy, your bitcher's on a milk carton. <laughs> Sean Kemp. Preparing for Christmas. All right, let's see here. I got nine kids and seven women. This goes to Shaniqua and Ray Ray in San Francisco. Or is they in Dallas? Hold up. Twan is in Sacramento. I got Sean Jr. in Denver. And the other Sean... On our hotline right now. Um, well, you've heard of them. You heard everybody brag about them all night long. We've had uh, Tiny uh, Archibald, Nate Archibald on. We've had the Iceman George Gervin on tonight. We've had JoJo White on tonight. We've had Jim Jones on tonight. And you've heard all four of them 
brag about the man we're about to put on the air, David Stern, and what a great job David Stern has done with the NBA. He's the commissioner of the NBA. We're going to welcome him to Cleveland. Commissioner David Stern of the NBA, welcome to Cleveland. Thanks for those nice words. Thanks for having me. And can you play tomorrow or, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or can you play on Sunday? We're running out of players. But. Wow, what's happening? A lot of players uh, coming up lame, huh, Commish? Uh, it's uh, incredible, but, but they're coming. Uh, they want to be here in Cleveland. Alonzo said, I can't play. Uh, I'm in a soft cast, but I'm coming to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's true of most of the players who aren't taking uh, special medical treatment. Uh, but but it's a hard season. Uh, they've been playing real hard. And uh, we've had a, I think this is the, this is the largest number of injuries we've ever had at this time of year. Yeah, that's one of the downsides to an all-star game, uh, as you as being a commissioner, uh, is is the injuries uh, because uh, the players really don't want to risk injury in an all-star game, and you, and you really can't blame them, can you? I don't blame them, no. but I will. But I will tell you this: um, our players, if they can play, they always they always come and play. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the the injuries that we've had are are pretty serious. They've they've missed games. I mean, for example, Shaq, he's uh he hasn't played all week. Uh, Alonzo's not going to be playing. Uh, so so these are not. These are not players who are sore that decided not to risk injury. These are players who are, who are injured, who can't play. Mm -hmm. We're talking with the commissioner of the NBA, David Stern. David, uh, we had uh, Tiny uh, Archibald on today. We had George Gervin on. We had uh, JoJo White and, of course, our own Jim Jones here in Cleveland. They all bragged about David Stern and the great job he has done with the NBA. Um, you know, uh, well, how, how did how did you do it? Uh, how did it happen? I mean, are you the one that should be taking the credit, David? No, no, I uh, I'm I'm pretty smart and I work hard and I hire a lot of people, um, and uh, and we have one of the great products that uh, has ever graced this earth in terms of sports competition, mm -hmm. and uh, and what we've had is uh, is the opportunity through through great ownership, the kind of uh, support that. This franchise has gotten from the guns, the kind of support has gotten from Cleveland, the kind of building that you have here. You multiply that uh, across this league with new buildings going up, uh, uh, you know, enthusiastic crowds. And despite what you read in the newspapers, by and large, uh, a group of players who love to show their fans on the global basis that it's the best game in the world mm -hmm. and 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 we've been had the opportunity in the last 15 years or so to do just that is there any doubt now that is the number one sport worldwide nba basketball well i think i think there is some doubt i think soccer probably has a rightful claim to that but after soccer uh i don't think there's uh you know any doubt about who's number two and if i were soccer i'd be uh looking over my shoulder because because uh, the world really uh, is uh, catching on. Our players, uh, you know, if Terrell Brandon could walk down the street in Cleveland or he can probably walk down the street in Beijing and NBA fans where there are many in both cities would recognize him and say, hey, there's Terrell Brandon of the Cavaliers. It's uh, the, the wonder of satellite delivery and the flow of information is extraordinary. Was that a goal that David Stern, commissioner of the NBA, wanted to achieve, a long-term goal, making the sport not only big here in the, in the United States, but across the world? Mike, I hate to kill your storyline, but what we've tried to do is just take advantage of each opportunity as it's come up. Mm -hmm. uh, saying that we had goals or even plans is a little bit more structured than, than we were. What, what, what has happened is as we have seen the NBA grow, we have realized that as the satellite communications has grown, as television has grown around the world, it gave us an opportunity to place our game. Uh, and we started practically giving it away. That was our goal, to get it. Once we saw that there were these new channels that dawned on us that we could get a foothold, it would grow, people would see it, and they would love it. Uh, now, they're not crazy about it all over the world, but they do like it. They... Uh, they're playing it in, in uh, increasing numbers, and as uh, the images of our players have been increasingly shown around the world, there have just been more, not only fans of basketball, but people playing basketball. Is there any uh, plans at making this a worldwide league someday, uh, Commissioner? Um, not, not, at the, not really. I mean, our, our, our vision of worldwide is, is to 
uh, have our champion play in the McDonald's Championship, which we're going to be doing again this year in Paris in October. The NBA champion goes to a club championship of the world, and they're going to play against the champions of other leagues, five other leagues from around the world. Uh, it's our, our players have been authorized to participate in the Olympics and the World Championships, and we'll be playing sort of regular season games as we did play two games in uh, in Japan this year. We'll be playing exhibition games as we have in Mexico and Europe, but there are no plans to sort of plant the NBA franchise flag uh, mm. outside of North America. We're talking with the commissioner of the NBA, David Stern. Uh, David, uh, the game is Sunday, but the party started tonight. Uh, it's much the NBA All-Star um, game weekend is much more than just the game Sunday. Uh, was that done by design? Yes. Um, you know, when uh, I guess it was 1984, we uh, we were going back to Denver, and that was the place where the slam dunk contest was uh, originated in the ABA. And 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 uh, the Denver team wanted to have a slam dunk contest. Uh, I wanted to have a legends game because I'm a I'm a great fan of our great historical players and I always like the opportunity to bring them back and, and share some good times with them and let our fans really tell them how much they appreciate it. So we did an All-Star Saturday and from that uh, it was overwhelmingly successful. We've never had an empty seat. Uh, we added a three-point shot contest. We sort of retired the Legends game due to injury and substituted a rookie game without, uh, without stopping to invite the, the Legends back. Uh, and then because, the, which I know is a sensitive subject, the tickets were in such short supply because of the way we used the game, uh, we decided we needed something to let the city experience it uh, in more ways than we were able to. So we came up with Jam Session, which is, uh, which is you know, in downtown now, playing to packed houses where people get a chance to come in and experience the interactivity of the NBA together with playing some basketball. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that's really, uh, you know, at each step, we tried to make it as fan-friendly as we possibly could. Because of the shortage of tickets for the people of the city, which the All-Star Game is being held in, is there any chance that maybe some year down the road it'll be sort of like the Final Four? How the final, have you noticed how the Final Four is gravi gravitating towards domes? You know, that would, it, it's kind of interesting. We'll nev we would, I could eliminate all of the complaints, which I understand, if we had it in a neutral site. <laughs> mm -hmm. We could play it in New Orleans and put it in a dome, mm -hmm. but at least it's been my view, and it's one that I'm, I'm, I still hold, that it's a fun event. It does good things for downtowns and business and hotels, and uh, to the greatest extent possible, we'd like to circulate it around our teams to the cities that have supported us, even if we get a little bad ink with respect to ticket availability. I think on balance, the people in the city would like to have that city's sort of dateline be the capital of the basketball world for the weekend. And, and clearly, Cleveland is, this weekend, the the capital of the basketball world. Great explanation. Uh, no wonder you've done such a great... Everybody's bragging about you, Commissioner. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like... Like a kid in a candy store. To me, to be able to walk into a room and to say hi to Bill Russell <laughs> or or hello to Bob Pettit or Billy Cunningham, Moses Malone, uh, Wilt, I mean, Oscar, you just, you go down the list. Uh, this is going to be, uh, you know, an extraordinary weekend just to have these folks around and have the opportunity for us to say thank you and to greet them one more time. Uh, if that doesn't get you excited, then you're not a basketball fan. Well, and what it does for the economy of Cleveland, as you pointed out, I mean, uh, we've heard here uh, uh, Tyson's having a big party, the Shaq's having a big party, Ted Turner's having a big party. He rented out a restaurant for a whole night along with Michael Jordan. Uh, we, running, we, yeah. we, we, we're entertaining. We're having, uh, you know, ourselves. we having, I think, in the course of the weekend, the NBA itself is having, I think, between 10 and 15 parties. Wow. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm at a restaurant now as a guest, uh, uh, a fun restaurant uh, for someone else that we deal with. So, so it's really extraordinary to to see what you know. It, it is a, it becomes a party town for a weekend, but it's it's also a basketball town, and and I think it's appropriate because Cleveland uh, has uh, has supported the NBA mm -hmm. uh, very well, 
and uh, it's uh, it's our delight to to uh, really be here and to and to see the uh, the Gund Arena, which is this extraordinary facility that that people come to visit to see how they're going to construct their new buildings around this country. So I think it's a win-win for everyone. Commissioner David Stern, before you, we let you run here, I'd like to ask you just a couple of last questions. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, number one, are you pretty satisfied with uh, your dealings with uh, Dennis Rodman and his reinstatement back into basketball? I, I think uh, on balance uh, it, we're at the right place. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a principle that we've established as to what's acceptable in and around the court and uh, uh, on the other hand, if Dennis can meet the standards, it's it's good for all of us if he just plays basketball and we show him he's welcome back. Mm -hmm. And the last thing, uh, Commissioner, uh, one disturbing thing about this whole weekend, okay? Uh, did you hear the remarks that Kyle Malone, mailman, made about Cleveland? No. Yeah, he said that... Uh, he can't wait to get out of here. He's not even going to take a shower after the game. He's just going to get his transportation and get the hell out of Cleveland. You know, you know. Uh, I always thought he was a really nice guy. I, I tell you what, he had to be pulling someone's leg. You think it, so? It, it is so unlike Carl. Uh, but if he said it, uh, you know, he didn't mean it. And if he meant it, he's wrong. And and uh, uh, it just means that he's. Uh, in, in at least in one area, he's only getting older rather than wiser. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard that side of Carl Malone before in my life. I was shocked when I read it in the paper, you know? I uh, He's here, and he's going to have a great time, and uh, uh, so don't... Uh, you know, don't don't you know? No, I, after I, we after yeah. we bring him into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, or the Great Lakes Science Center or or uh, the Tower, where we're going to be having the parties, uh, um, he'll probably want to become a permanent resident of Cleveland. And uh, Commissioner, tell him we do have hot water here. I'm, uh, you know, I'm. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll whisper it in his ear when yes. you see me talking to him. If he uh, if he wins the MVP of the game and I hand him the trophy, I'll I'll whisper it in his ear at that moment. Commissioner David Stern, thank you for taking some time out with us. And you got to be uh, walking on clouds because we had some legends on today and not the schmooze again, but well, the way they bragged about you, uh, you definitely have to be doing the right well, thing. Well, it's a mutual admiration society, I assure you. Thanks for having me, Mike. En enjoy your stay. I'll see you around this weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the station, Mike's not here. Aren't you paying attention? Haven't you heard this before? This is the best of Mike Trevisano on News Radio WTAM 1100. I think there has to be some consistency when dealing with professional athletes from sport to sport. I don't see it with Drocker and Allen Iverson. I think it's basically the same. I don't want to hear about artistic expression. I don't want to hear about he's expressing himself. That's the way he grew up. The man has $120 million he got from the NBA. He has some responsibility to that uh, corporation, just like I have some responsibility to the corporation I work for to be a decent human being and not talking about killing hoes and bitches, okay? Well, well, why did, uh, so, why, why I mean, hey, hey, just, just let me say this to you, Steve, okay? The NBA right now is at an all-time low, all right? Um, the ratings are just not there. There's some cities that are going to have great ratings. L.A. has a great team. They're going to have great ratings. Portland, cities like that. But across the board, the NBA right now is at an all-time low. All right? The NBA will destroy itself. So don't worry about it. The, the more Allen Iversons you put in the NBA, the more TVs and radios that go click. So eventually it'll just destroy itself. So you really don't have anything to worry about. Just hope it doesn't do too much damage before it does destruct. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Because it will. Because let me be brutally honest with you, all right? Have you gone to an NBA game? Have you looked in the stands? What do you see? You see white America sitting in the stands. 95% is white America. So guess what? The NBA's a business. 95% of the fans are white America that are paying, not watching it free or listening to it free, that are paying, so you better kiss their ass. And you better do, play the game the way the game, the way Michael Jordan played the game, the way Magic Johnson played the game. Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan didn't cut off the hand that's feeding them with corn rolls and tattoos and, and F this and bitch that and hold this. 
They played the game. That's why Nike gave them $60 million a year. That's why every sponsor lined up to give Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson millions and millions and millions of dollars. And that's why the NBA was at its all-time height. Okay? The more Allen Iversons you get, the farther down the NBA goes. That's as simple as that. That's the cold, hard truth. You got to service the people that are paying the bills. You have to play the game in the United States of America. If you don't want to play the game, you will destroy the golden goose. Michael Jordan knew it. Magic Johnson knew it. And they played the game. And the NBA was at its all-time height with those guys. All-time. You ever heard anybody say a bad word about either one? No. You ever heard a white man say, I hate Magic Johnson? Seriously. No. I mean, even at a party, anywhere. Now, Magic might donate all the money in the world to black college funds. And he could be a militant. And he could be, he could be so pro-black, it's unbelievable. But he's not walking around with cornrows and tattoos because he's playing the game. He knows what it takes for him to be successful. And he owed something to the league that made him successful. So the more Allen Iversons that are out there, the farther down the NBA goes. The NBA will self-destruct. Mark my words. It's at an all-time low now. No one wants any part of the NBA. They don't have far to go now. The f right. No. I, mean, they're, they're, I mean, I don't know why they don't have a meeting with these players and say, hey, baby, this golden goose is almost dead. The Associated Press, AM 1100. And that quarterback. Number two. Timmy, Timmy. Oh, yeah. How oh, you can throw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Timmy, Timmy. Oh, baby. Super Bowl. He came from Kentucky. He was oh so young. Rifles to Irv. My one is gone. Takes the snap, drops back, looks down the field. Johnson breaks open the victory seal. Timmy, Timmy. Oh yeah, how you can throw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Timmy, Timmy. Oh baby, Super Bowl. The dogs are barking. We're all having fun. Timmy will lead us to that place in the sun. He's got style and class. Eddie. 22. The MVP of the AFC. Timmy, Timmy. Oh, yeah. How oh, you can throw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Timmy, Timmy. Oh, baby. Super Bowl. Wallaba and Pine. Give the Blitz at bay. Give Timmy some time. He'll make the big play. He's got style and class at age 22. The MVP of the AFC. Timmy, Timmy. Oh, yeah. How you can throw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Timmy, Timmy. Oh, baby. Super Bowl. and Browns fans. This is the big one. Now, continuing coverage on News Radio, WTAM 1100, Cleveland. Christmas doesn't necessarily have to come in a box wrapped up with a bow. Good evening, I'm Tom Moore. This is the 6 o'clock report on News Radio, WTAM 1100. Details coming up. News, a service of the Liberty Auto Group. Now, Mike Stone has Channel 3 weather. Cold tonight with scattered flurries, lows near 5. Oh, wow. Temperature right now, 17 with a wind chill of 7 above at your official weather station, News Radio WTAM 1100. The Christmas spirit lived out today at a lot of locations around Cleveland, and I'm not talking about in people's homes. I'm talking about 
institutions, some of which normally help the needy, some of which are businesses, but want to be able to lend a hand. For well, the first time ever today, the Bishop Cosgrove Center downtown served Christmas dinner. We served probably about 160 breakfasts and probably 300 or more lunches, dinners, turkey dinners. We had turkey and all the trimmings. We had eggs, sausage, bagels, and grits, coffee, and cocoa, and cookies. Sharon Fields runs the Bishop Cosgrove Center. She says today was special. A couple reasons. One of them is that former Indians pitcher Jose Mesa helped out in the kitchen. And she says the tab for today was picked up by the Jewish Federation. And the Jewish Federation also provided volunteers. Well, they celebrated Christmas uh, nearby at a watering hole where many of the regulars live right upstairs. Team coverage from News Radio WTAM 1100's Greg Saber. Christmas is giving, and those in need are found in church basements with volunteers serving Christmas dinner, but also at places like Moe's Bar and Grill on East 17th Street, where Moe's gives dinners away to residents of the upstairs boarding house it operates. We have uh, ham and uh, yams and green beans and a roll. That's all. It is a simple dinner. So you're doing your part on Christmas? Right. Moe's manager Roger Simon says it's a small part of Christmas tradition. Moe's Bar and Grill quietly continues. Greg Saber News Radio, WTAM 1100. Some businesses are open whether it's Christmas Day or just any other day of the year. David's Restaurant at the Marriott Key Center Hotel downtown was open today. Restaurant's manager Adam Ward says he doesn't mind working on Christmas. So you guys got to work, huh? Hey, not a problem. We like working. <laughs> he says some folks happily work on Christmas so that others can have the day off. A homeless man did not live to see Christmas 2000. Cleveland police got an anonymous tip leading them to a vacant house on East 114th. Inside, they found the body of Chico Taylor, who was said to be homeless and living in that vacant home. Cause of death, gunshot wound to the chest. Coroner has to determine how old Taylor was and how long he'd been in the house before he was found. Many people wondering if George W. Bush has what it takes to be president of the world's biggest superpower. He's getting a vote of confidence tonight from former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. He will understand... Uh, uh, those decisions that only he can make and he will good get good advice of people who will hopefully give him the widest range of choices before him and knowing the people I think that this is what will happen and a story now we call this little piggy got frostbite most sane Americans strap on their boots when they hear that tune some teenagers don't they're wearing open toed no socks sandals in the snow the boys wear them because we're kind of lazy. Zach Hoisington doesn't mind getting popsicle toes. Beside, many school classmates wear winter sandals and flip-flops, too. Girls do it so that they can see their toenail painted. Why waste a pedicure just because it's snowing? I guess you just put a mind over money. You don't really notice it. 16-year-old Liz Markey wears snow sandals because... This is the first time in our lives where our parents aren't constantly monitoring our clothes. Or their toes. Andy Field, ABC News, Washington. Channel 3 weather is next, 604 News Radio WTAME 1100. 2020 sports, it may take two weeks for doctors to determine if Zadruna Silkowskis will need surgery on the broken bone in his left foot. Cavs will play at Charlotte tomorrow night. The Rams, Colts, and Dolphins clinched NFL playoff first in the final weekend of the season. Steelers were left out, and the Browns will pick third in next year's NFL draft. Mike Snyder, News Radio WTAM 1100. This is all a big trick. Mike's not really here. We're playing a tape. Don't call the station. No one will answer right now. This is the best of Mike Trivisano on the big one. WTAM 1100. Well, on my hotline, uh, I have a gentleman who uh, played uh, football in the NFL. He played football when football was football, in my opinion. Some of the best years I ever had in my life was rooting for and against the Los Angeles Rams, depending on who they were playing. And on our hotline right now is Deacon Jones. Deacon, how we doing today, Deacon? Hey, fine. Fine, Mike, and you? Hey, this is one heck of a book. It's almost like an encyclopedia. <laughs> almost 600 pages, Deacon. Yeah, it's quite a lot of material. And, uh, uh, you, know, um, I, you know, Deacon led an interesting life. And... Um, I think that uh, we tried to highlight all the things that we figured the fan would love to read and, and, and try to put all that information into some kind of context where it makes sense. And that was a very difficult task. It took six years to get it all done, and I'm just so proud of it, and, and uh, I'm just happy to death that it's really been accepted by the public. It's really, and I've just started to read it. It's called Head Slap, and we're talking with Deacon Jones. Deacon, uh, even the title, Head Slap, no longer allowed in the NFL. Um, tell us about that head slap. 
Well, you know, the interesting part about that, that was a move that uh, I kind of popularized uh, during my career, and it was very good to me. It, it uh, enhanced my pass rushing abilities and made me the best in the history of the game. And I, you know, uh, I was very, very hurt at first when uh, it was um, it was outlawed in the NFL. And but after a while, you know, uh, having something outlawed that you you perfected sort of work in your favor because. Uh, you know, uh, I've gotten more coverage out of this thing uh, with it being outlawed than I probably would have got if it had been a move that was still being used. A a um, actually, Deacon, it's a move that uh, also that, uh, like wrestlers, high school and collegiate, not this junk that professional wrestling, but the high school and collegiate level, a lot of times uh, um, they give you that little slap to the face and then they take you down by the legs, right? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, see, that, that, that head slap got your attention. You know, it, 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 it kind of deterred holding. It, it, it made the offensive lineman think about saving his neck <laughs> rather than e executing his blocking uh, uh, habits. Now, you know, when you equate that to life, you know, in my life in the NFL and my life prior to the NFL was full of head slaps. I mean, in each individual head slap is described in the book, and that's what makes it interesting. You know Deacon as the, this violent, uh, excellent football player who used this move to uh, enhance his playing ability. But you don't know the deacon that got head slapped in real life, and, and each one of those head slaps are de described in the book, and I think you'll get a big kick out of it. The fearsome foursome, Deacon Jones, Merlin Olson, Rosie Greer, Lamar Lundy. Was there ever a better defensive line, Deacon? I don't think so. I, you, know, you know, we were, we were the prototype. We, we were big, we were fast, we had that savvy, we had that commitment. We brought to the game a, a sort of ingredient that the game at that time really needed because defensive football was not that popular. And uh, I think uh, uh, by I taking that name and, and also bringing the game with it uh, gave football a big boost in the 60s. And, you know, defensive lines were, were, were the thing of the 60s. And we had the Baltimore Coat line, the Purple People Eaters from the Vikings, and the Dallas Doomsday defense. So, you know, defense was sort of a collective effort. Yeah, and, de uh, defenses back then, Deacon, had nicknames. Today, uh, there are no nicknames for defenses the way they were back then. Like you just mentioned, the Purple People Eaters, uh, the Fearsome Foursome, Doomsday, the Steel Curtain. Uh, what's happened to the nicknames? Well, you know, I think it went with a lot of other things. Uh, you know, the game then, you could, you could name the entire defensive unit. But I dare you to do that now. Yeah, well, you can't. Be Every year it changes. <laughs> right. And then also the guys are specialists now. They come in for different situations. True. But we, when you looked at us, you looked at the same four men up front and the same seven in the back. And uh, that, that's the way most defenses was then. We played every down. and So, therefore, we could take a name and make it stick. Nowadays, it would be difficult to do that because you got guys who play third and long, guys who play third and short. you got guys who play all down the distance. And that's the, one of the differences in that game, uh, the game today in our game. Deacon, tell us a nasty story. We heard football was nasty back then. You hit somebody hard, uh, you went after that person even harder. Any good nasty stories you can share with us? I mean, you know, I, you know, like I said, I don't call anything I did nasty. But, uh, you know, some interesting stories. Uh, uh, one was, you know, we played Atlanta Falcons in Atlanta, and they had a quarterback by the name of Bob Berry. And, you know, I, we used to have some good confrontations with uh, Atlanta. And, uh, you know, Dutch Van Brockton used to be a coach down there. And Dutch hated everybody. So I, I always would give special effort when I played Dutch's teams because Dutch would call me some awful names on the sidelines. And he, he would do everything to try to irritate me. And um, uh, so Bob Berry was quarterbacking. And I broke through the line. Merle and I was running a stunt. And I broke free, man. And I had a... I wore a cast on my right hand, and that cast came all the way up to my elbow. And um, as I w went past Bob Barry, I stuck that cast out, and I caught him right underneath the, underneath his chin. And his helmet flew off, and it went about 20 yards down the field, man. And I thought that was his head, because I, I hit this guy with a steel cast, I mean a cement cast. And, um, man, he stood there for, for about five seconds. I was on the ground looking up, and he had taken my best shot. And I, I, I was really, I was bewildered. And just as I started to get bewildered, 
his eyes rolled back in his head, and he, he went out like a light. He woke up Tuesday morning. <laughs> and I, I thought that was probably the nastiest thing I did was trying to eliminate the quarterback from the NFL. You thought you knocked his head right off his shoulders, I huh? thought sure it was his head. <laughs> Deacon, in your wildest dreams, you ever think that uh, there would be no football in Los Angeles and the Rams would be in St. Louis? <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, we're a major market, and we, you know, football <laughs> yeah. has been here for over 50 years. And no, I, I never knew right up until the last day that um, we always thought that they'd make a deal some sort of way. But, you know, to see the Rams leave was like a like a like losing your your, your favorite relative. Oh boy. Um, it, we, was, it was disastrous. Yeah, we and lost. We still our, haven't recovered. We lost our football team here in Cleveland. I mean, uh, it's uh, the NFL. I, I have absolutely deacon no idea where it's headed. I really don't. But, you know, you did one smart thing in Cleveland that I, I wish the heck we'd have done it here. Which is you kept your history. Yeah. You kept your name, your colors, and, and, and your history. You mm -hmm. know, right now, I, you know, the, the, for the former Los Angeles Rams, you know, their history is in advance. You know, mm -hmm. you don't mean nothing anymore. In other words, uh, yes, there's, the Rams do exist in, in St. Louis, but you can't relate to that. You know, so you're caught. You know, my history and Merlin's history and the rest of the Ram Hall of Famers in Canton. But for the rest of our players, you know, we're, we're, you know, it's like we don't have a home. True. You know, and, uh, you know, football has to give some thought to franchise movement because I think that it, 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 it puts the stability of the game in jeopardy. And I think that they're going to have to sit down and make some hard-line decisions and create a method of dealing with that because we don't want to hurt this game long term. This is a beautiful game, and... You know, it, the fans love it. They accept it. And if you're not careful, you can chase them off. Now, Deacon, you still living in the Los Angeles area then? Yes, I live in Anaheim. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, Deacon, let me ask you a question. Uh, you've played football for a lifetime. You've been around it for a lifetime. Are, uh, is the NFL starting to be overcoached? Is it starting to hurt the game? Well, I, you know, I said this, I said this several years ago that uh, I thought the coaches were getting too involved in the game. And, I, you know, I think that the game always has to remain between the lines, and it must be settled by 11 men on offense and 11 men on defense. And I think the more that the game stay on the field, the more it keeps its identity. Now, the reason I say that is because I know that the game can be played with quarterback calling the plays and a defensive captain calling the defensive signals. And it should be that captain against the other captain. And it should be those 11 men on offense against those 11 men on defense. And the game should be coached during the week and played by the players on Sunday. And all this garbage about sending this guy in for this situation, this stuff could be avoided, man. And let the 11 men out there settle this matter. And I think that when they get back to that, you know, and let the coaches coach, and teach you how to play the game, and let the guys play the game. Deacon, uh, today's athlete, uh, are you a little disappointed with today's athlete, or can you understand what's going on today? Well, I can both understand it, and in certain instances, yes, I, I am, I'm always disappointed when the game is not first. I think that with the age of, of the high salaries, and I think that that is, that is beautiful, I think that you can't be paid enough money to play football. Because, you know, there is no correlation or no understanding between the pain that we suffer in this business and the, the long-term and permanent pain that we suffer in this game. And there's no price tag that you can put on it. So money should be separate from the game. And I think that in the age of the high salaries, guys are not paying enough attention to the stabilization of the field play. I think that you've got to always keep the game itself on the front burner. And it must always be respected in that manner and played to its toughest position because the game is brutal, it's tough, and it must remain that way. Not legislate uh, uh, for certain positions, leg try to legislate the pain out of the game. Because sure. you ain't going to never do that. We're talking with Deacon Jones. Deacon has the book out, Head Slap. Very, very interesting book. Uh, Deacon, are your parents still living? Yeah, uh, my, my mother is. My mother's 94 years old. Yeah. She lives in Florida. Uh -huh. She's healthy as a horse. Got a little trouble with the eyes, but other than that, she's healthy as a horse and still a great NFL fan. Do you call her up and, like, yell at her daily? Oh, look here. No, no, in reverse. No, I thought maybe you'd be yelling at her and said, Ma, if you'd have waited 20 years to have me, Ma, I'd be making about $5 million a year. It, was, it wouldn't have changed nothing. You know, my mama still would be a Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson fan, yeah. and I'm third on the list. <laughs> I'm third on the list. I mean, those are her favorites. Uh, she, uh, 
You know, she's she's a she's a wonderful lady, but uh, you know, she kind of grew up with Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson, so I get you know I, I I met those two guys and got to know them real well, and I told my mom that boy, and she's more proud of me for doing that than I I was for the 14 <laughs> years of pro football. <laughs> Deacon, I just I'm just sitting here looking at the the cover of the book, and uh, I'm not sure who who's number 79 for the offensive lineman for this uh, 49ers on there. Do you know? Well, I, yes, I know who he is. You know, and you see that hand that's going upside his head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the head slap, you know. That was the one photo that I had in my arsenal of photos that I thought best described this book. And that's Cass Banisak. Oh, okay. He, yeah, he was the offensive tackle for the um, for the 49ers. And he also wears the number of probably the guy that uh, gave me the most trouble in my, my, my career, and that was Bob St. Clair mm -hmm. of the 49ers who, who wore that... Um, who wore that same number, but I got rid of all the pictures of Bob Sinclair because they were all defeating me, and I didn't want that in existence. <laughs> how about you had to go up against Ron Yeri with Minnesota many times? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, how was that matchup? Well, Ron, Ron Yeri was a fine football player. He was big, he was fast, he had all the techniques. Um, I enjoyed playing against him and, and, you know, naturally enjoyed playing against the Vikings, but he was a fine athlete. Hey, Deacon, before we let you run here, anybody in the NFL that you just loved to stomp on you didn't like at all? Well... All quarterbacks. Oh, all I am a permanent <laughs> hater of quarterbacks. I did one, one, the only thing in my career uh -huh. that I wish I could do over, uh -huh. and that is I could go back to the NFL and they give me at least eight more years, and I could finish the job I started, <laughs> and that was to eliminate that position from NFL football. <laughs> I think Bart Starr might have a few uh, arguments for you, telling you how you never got to him. Yeah, if he ever took the snap, I got to him. <laughs> there ain't a man out there that, that took a snap during my 14 years that I did not hit. Hey, Deacon, hit good. they talk about how quick you were. Uh, how quick were you, were you compared to today's athlete? We always hear this, wow, today's athlete is so much quicker. Could this today's athlete be quicker from the defensive end than Deacon Jones? There is no man, past, present, and possibly future, that was as quick as Deacon Jones. Now, the reason I say that, ladies and gentlemen, is because I could cut the light off and get in bed before it went off. <laughs> now, now when you look at when you look at today's athlete, yeah. and you go back and take my film. Take, take some film from my game in 1967, 68, or any year you want to, and take the fastest end that they got now. Take 25 plays apiece of, of all the phases of the game, the run, the sweep, the off-tackle play, the pass rush, and you put me against them, and then you'll find out exactly how quick I was and then how tough I was and how, how much speed I had that would probably cause these big, 350-pound tackles this day, a lot of trouble. <laughs> I'd blow by most of these guys, and they wouldn't even get their hand off the ground. Well, you know, that's true, because today uh, they've taken the steroids away from what uh, what we have learned, and that's why these these, these guys are so much heavier now. Uh, but it's not muscle, it's all fat. Well, it, well, in my in my estimation, and I know this for a fact, because I played this game, and, I, and I, my opinion in this area should be listened to. When you're 350 pounds, Yes, you're strong at the point of attack. No question about that. But no great defensive end is let you go use that strength at the point of attack. So you're going to mix quickness and speed in there, and you're going to be neutralized. Well, you can't play 110% on every down at 350 pounds. That's just obvious. True. You cannot do it. Now, when you're around 275 or 280, you can sprint 110% for 80, 90 plays a day and still give give everything you got on every down. And that's the difference between us and them. Yes, they're strong at the point of attack because they're big and they weight lift like crazy. But when you put some quicks in there and you and you put a few moves in there and you make them big guys move their feet for 60 minutes, they'll die. Deacon Jones, head slap, the life and times of Deacon Jones. Deacon, I got to go. Good luck with the book, head slap. Thanks for having me, guy, and, thanks for, and, and good luck to you. Hey, same to you, Deacon. Thank you. Since they blinded this man, you must put cash in his hand. 
don't call the station, Mike's not here. Aren't you paying attention? Haven't you heard this before? This is the best of Mike Trivisano on News Radio WTAM 1100. If the flag hits the socket, you must put money in his pocket. Well, if you hear a lot of stuttering and I sound like uh, a little bit like Greg Brenda or anything like that, excuse me, please, because uh, one of my all-time favorites, and in fact, probably my, and excuse me, uh, Ray, uh, probably my second all-time favorite because I'm a big Muhammad Ali fan, but I can't separate Sugar Ray Leonard and Muhammad Ali. I've been watching you fight for a lifetime. How you doing, Sugar Ray? Great. How you doing, buddy? Pretty good. Pretty good. In fact, I was uh, working for another radio station at the time. And I was at Caesar's Palace the night you fought Tommy Hearns. I think it was for the third time the night it was a draw. Uh, that was not a good year for me. <laughs> Tommy knocked me down twice. He was not cooperative at all. I don't know what happened to him. Way to bring that up out of the gate, Trip. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, but the reason I did bring that one up first is that 12th round had to be one of the greatest rounds in the history of boxing. I mean, it was almost like a cowboy movie where you... At one time, it was close. You almost knocked each other out at the same time. Do you remember that? Yeah, it got pretty pretty close, and uh, it was like, you know, two guys with two guns and ran out of bullets, and <laughs> but it was a good fight. That was a great fight. That was a great fight. We'll get to that, Ray, and we'll get to much more, but uh, you're in town uh, for uh, lo local runaways, right? Exactly. On behalf of Vartek and uh, the folks at 1010-811, we have donated uh, $25,000 in calling cars to the runaway facilities because there are a lot of times these kids who run away from home for whatever reason um, they don't have means of communicating with their family and loved ones and I think that this is a great program and uh, I encourage it totally. There's a, a, a you know a lot of people that are settled in everyday life really don't understand there is a big problem in this country with uh, runaways isn't there? There is because these kids are faced with a great deal of peer pressure and uh, they're influenced by whatever they see on television, or movies, and what have you. So these kids, a lot of times, these kids have very low self-esteem, and that's a problem. Now, you'll be going across the country with this, uh, with, with Vartek and, uh, and, and the uh, runaway program? I will be. In fact, uh, we have at least uh, eight more cities to attend uh, within this uh, two-week period. Mm -hmm. Now, you also have a management company with one of the famous agents, right? With Lee Seiber. He's one of my partners, and um, Lee is... Most sports fans know that he is the top sports attorney and also one of the country leading um, negotiator. Also, my partner here, Bjorn Rebney, uh, is my marketing guy, my president, and um, he, in fact, uh, was at one time the exclusive marketing guy for Oscar De La Hoya. We've seen Oscar uh, profit quite well outside the ring. And this is what it's all about, though, you know, because boxing, for the most part, have not reaped the benefits from the sport. Um, you look at other sports, basketball, football, baseball, where is that? The superstars in that, those sports, they have the advantage of having uh, great contract negotiations and publicity and marketing, what have you. So they profit outside the, their respective sports too. Boxing doesn't have that. With boxing, you find that historically, when you say management, all you think about is securing fights for that guy and not really building a long-term career. Why doesn't boxing have a union like uh, baseball, basketball, and football? Would the union help uh, if they had could form one? I don't necessarily think the union would help, although anything I welcome that would benefit the boxer. But for the most part, it's all management. You need someone to protect you, to look out for your best interests, and to build your career. Mm -hmm. How's Sugar Ray Leonard doing now, both physically and financially? Pretty good? I'm doing okay. Uh, my golf game still uh, uh, needs some help. But uh, for the most part, I'm happily married to a beautiful uh, lady, Bernadette, and um, three beautiful kids. Uh, my son, Ray Jr., graduated from college, Ohio University. He's into sports marketing. My youngest son, 14, Jarrell. Uh, playing football and basketball, and my daughter, Camille, who I'm looking forward to seeing today, uh, she's 18 months old. So I have a wonderful life. I've been blessed with a wonderful sport and talent, and thank God, you know, I got out of the game, and now I can live vicariously through other fighters. Hey, Kim had a question for you about your son, Ray Jr. Remember those commercials you guys seven did up. together? Yes. Seven Up commercials. I, yes. You told me it was Pepsi, and I, I thought, was, yeah, was going to argue with you that Pepsi, it was Seven, seven Up. Pepsi, Seven Up, Coca-Cola. Coca -Cola. So, it's a soft drink. Yeah, soft drink. <laughs> yeah, well, I still knew it was Seven Up. Don't give me that. Are, are you my son's age? 
I'm 28, yeah, so I don't well, think so. Well, yes, uh, no? He, he likes older women. Yeah. <laughs> I'm married too, but if he's as good looking as you are. <laughs> now, Ray, I'm looking at you. How much do you weigh? I weigh about 165, maybe. Okay, now, you fought uh, for the light heavyweight champion, Donnie, uh, what was it? Donnie Lalonde. Uh, well, yeah. 170, well, actually, it was for 168 and 175. I mean, you knocked him silly. Well, he cooperated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how does, how does uh, uh, someone as, as, as uh, you know, and, I, and I'm not trying to, you know, uh, insult you here, but I mean, you're slight of build to, compared to uh, light heavyweights, uh, is yeah. what I'm saying. Well, you know? no, I wasn't really that heavy. I just, you know, I, I had a little power, had speed. But um, I trained very hard. I mean, when, I, when it came to training, I was very religious about that. Mm -hmm. Now, we go back to those uh, great fights. I mean, uh, the first one I remember was Benitez. And, uh, oh, yes. Th that, yes. That was a good one, wasn't it? But see, talking about Benitez...